the year. That's off. Because Welcome to what's going on here uh, on this uh, Tuesday. We're here on Tuesday. Uh, my name is Bob Venn. The program's called What's Going On Here. And uh, we have gone, uh, most of our stories have been in the state of New York, northern tier. We did go over to Vermont once and worked on Shelburne Farms. And today, we aren't quite as far away, but we're in a different country. We've gone international. We're in what is known, an area known as Odeltown. And we're here to discuss uh, uh, the history of this area and the people who left from this French area and went down into our northern tier and helped settle our area. And our guest today, uh, we have two people, is Jean Lebrun, Jean and Robert uh, Boyce, and we're in the home of Robert Boyce on the uh, Odeltown Road. That's right. And here, tell us where we are, Mr. LeBrun, right in this house right here? Yeah, this house here, you can see it, uh, the, picture, the picture was taken about 55 years ago, and this is, as you can see it today. And You've added a porch. With a, yes, adding the porch. And it is situated on the Odeltown Road, that is the road leading from the border opposite the White's Corner to the village of Lacoe. Mm -hmm. Okay, before we get into the building and the history here, we'd like to find out a little bit about uh, Jean Lebrun. How do you spell Lebrun? L-E-B-R-U-N. What's that mean? What does Lebrun mean? Well, it's complicated for brown. <laughs> <laughs> All right. right. It means brown. That's and right. uh, Jean is J-E-A-N? That is right. You, you ever use J-O-H-N? No? No. No. Because you see, uh, I like to uh, complicate, uh, complicating uh, matters. You like to complicate yes, things. Yes, I'll tell you why, because my wife's name is Jean, spelled the same way. Uh-huh. <laughs> yes, well now, your wife is not a stranger to many of these people out here. You've come to the States instead of staying up in Canada. What did, what did, who did you marry? Oh, well, I married my wife, Jean Finion, in Champlain, New York, on the 19th of February, 1954. All right, and that... And uh, tell us a little bit about Jean. What, uh, where are you working now, or what have you been doing on you, most of your lifetime? Well, I came in Odeltown in 1948. That is 45 years ago. And I started my career in the custom. I ended my career in the custom in 1982. And instead of retiring, I uh, started another uh, career, which is uh, searching the history of the Seigneury of La Colle and Beaujeu, and also the ge uh, genealogy part of it. Look, you know, I forgot, here we, here's our, did I, I already introduced you, Robert? I guess I did introduce Robert Boyce, our other, and he is, this is his home, this is where he lives, and we're in his kitchen in the back part of this home, and there's a lot of history to this home. And how long have you lived here? All my life. All your life? That's my picture in the baby carriage. Right here? Is yeah. that right? If, yeah. you, if you can look at the little baby. Oh, there are two people. That's your father and mother? Is that uh, the father on that side uh, and my grandfather on this side. Uh huh. Yeah. So the Boyce family have owned this property for a long time? Since 1926. See, that's even older than me, Robert. Uh, <laughs> well, we've met you before in Pla uh, Champlain. You go to Champlain from time to time. About three times a day. Three times a day. You end up uh, down near a. One of our restaurants there in the shopping right. mall? Do you have a there. buddy in there or something? Yeah, buddy in there, I put a lot of time in. I know everybody there. Well, that's very good. That's where I first met you. I was looking for a place to store a car one time, and I was introduced to Robert, and he offered that place here. Then I, I gave the car away to a friend of mine, so it didn't wake out, but I remembered the name. All right, we're here to talk about what you just uh, mentioned, uh, Jean. And... Uh, You come back to that? Okay. Yes, we'll come back to that. Okay. What do you want? Where do you want to go first? Enough. Well, we'll start uh, by talking about the, the the main anniversary that involves the city of La Colle Beaujeu. So we're going back to uh, 260 years ago. Yeah. When you talk about a signory, maybe you better tell us what a signory is. And Beaujeu, I, I assume, is a name of a person. No, that's right. All right. A seigneury was a domain given in concession by the king to a noble person or a person that had done something very uh, uh, valuable to the king of France then. So you have 
grant of land that were given to those people they were called seigneur because it was a, a higher title if you want to be called seigneur than landlord and you will see that we're talking here about two seigneuries at the beginning and the size of this seigneury here were what they called then in a French measure lieu so it was two lieu which equals six miles wide by nine miles deep and we're talking here that this red line you can see is what we're is the border today the 45th uh, parallel so this is today Canada and this is today uh, our area around Champlain but it may not have been that way then was this also US at that time that is right so this is what we're coming to talk about all right with this map here okay continue on okay so if you look at the dates here on April the 8th 1733 this seigneury here that I'm showing you was given to the Sieur de la Ronde who he was a captain of the French army the next day the following day April the 9th 1733 this concession from this mark here way down here was given to the Sieur de Bouger and they had the responsibility to bring uh, people to work the land to develop the land for them unfortunately those two seigneurs were not able to uh, develop their seigneury so in uh, on May the 10th 1741 those two seigneury was reunited to the crown that was they went back to the crown yes all right and if we go here on March the 22nd 1743 Sieur Daniel Dienard de Beaujeu received this concession which was the Seigneury of La Colle which originally was given had been given to the Sieur de la Ronde and in, on March the 6th 1752 Sieur Daniel Dienard de Beaujeu requested the seigneury that had been given to his father in 1733 and reunited to the crown in 1741 to be given to him as a seigneury. This was also accepted as long as the two seigneuries from then on we be, was to be considered to be forming only one seigneury or if you want more uh, one manor or one domain. All right, what we're seeing here again now to locate us, this is the lake flowing north, right through here. And right where we are today on the uh, 276 or White's Corner, we're located just about where this letter S is right here. It's sideways. Right about here is where we are located today, which uh, is in Canada, but at one time, uh, no, I guess it was never in the United States, I beg your pardon. But the line was changed. This red line happened later is that, that is right this is where the border was originally right here in 17 uh, uh, in 1733 that was the, the the line dividing those two seigneuries okay but nothing to do with the countries not at all. all this was all not Canada all. oh yes yeah but if you want to go back now it was called New France all right including our area oh yes okay yes this is 50 years before our uh, 1776 when we became a country uh, we're talking in the 1730s and then 1752 the last time. Go ahead, John. Okay, if you want to, a uh, little recapitulation if you want. Okay. Uh, this seigneury of La Colle was given first to Sieur Denis de la Ronde. And this seigneury of the Beaujeu was first given to Sieur Louis de Beaujeu. And then this one was given back in uh, 1743 to uh, Sieur uh, Li, uh, Louis Lienard de Beaujeu and then this one was added on to, uh, to his seigneury as one seigneury in uh, 1752. Now as we all know that this was under the French regime so when we came New France came under the British regime this seigneury which was only one seigneury then 
was bought by Lieutenant Colonel Gabriel Christie, who was an army uh, officer of the British Army at the time. So if we go by the dates, we're talking about the big anniversary 19 to uh, 93 this year. So we got 260 years ago, mm -hmm. again here, and then we go to uh, 250 years ago that those two seigneuries were finally reunited as one. And then 230 years ago, it changed ownership to the British. Right. And now, if you want to talk about this red line here, right. right after the American Revolution, in 1783, it was accepted that the line dividing the two countries, Canada and the United States, would be the 45th parallel. So this is the, the red line here telling you this. And what I was saying that there's more in common than being neighbor between the part of the United States so close to the border and Canada is that all that territory was on the during the French uh, regime belonging to one seigneury and the territory uh, south of this red line occupied now by Rosses Point Champlain and Paris Mill, originally it was the territory, the territory of the Seigneurie of the Beaujeu. You know, you said that when you finished customs you got into this new uh, checking these seigneuries out. Yes. Uh, where do you go to research and find this kind of information? Is this in writing someplace? Oh yes. Oh it is? Oh yes, because see this map, this reproduction of map you can get the, uh, this map at the archives uh, in Ottawa, for instance, in Montreal, and uh, big researching uh, centers. There's uh, societies of all kinds uh, that are doing all the, uh, keeping all the records that can be found. Okay. Uh, we're, we'll be right back to you. We're talking with Jean Lebrun and Robert Boyce this morning. We're not talking with Robert Boyce very much. He's making the facilities available for us to be sitting here. And John LeBron is explaining our, our area. We'll be getting back to this in a moment. Please stay tuned and uh, stay tuned with uh, Hometown Cable every day at uh, 1.15, 4.30, 8 o'clock, midnight, and 8 the following morning. Five showings, three hours each of the same program every day. Something different on Hometown Cable, courtesy of uh, Calvin and Sam Castine and... Friends and families. Now, Jean, the 45th parallel, which is the red line, yeah. is not where the border is no. today. Is that correct? No. It's somewhere between the red and the black. That is right. Actually, it would be about 4,200 feet north of the red line. Now, there came a time when they built the fort, and they built it on the wrong side of the line. It was built up above here. Yes. So it had been in Canada that there was uh, an agreement made between the two governments and they gave more land uh, to the United States in this area and took some away over in Maine and gave that to Canada? I believe so. And that's, I think, one of your records here? The, yeah, it shows the treaty. that, it, yes, that it, in, nine, in 1842, by the terms of the webster Ashburton Treaty, this narrow line of land was accepted as the given to the United States uh, and being accepted as the what you call the borderline. Okay. But then we used to the uh, it was called the provincial line, what we know as the borderline at the moment. Okay. Now there is no fence on the border, but uh, you you got a couple of pictures here. Now this this home you may recognize on Rose Avenue and tell us about this. Okay, this mark, this marker here, as you can see, this real little red uh, light there, you will see it on the picture here. So this is the house of Cyril Menard on Rose Avenue and Rouses Point. And this marker here was put there in 1845 following the treaty of the uh, Webster Ashburton, which yeah. was signed in 1842. That's the actual... 45th parallel. That is right. What you see here 
the red uh, line there, for instance. So that's nearly a mile above that is still the United States, but that is the parallel itself. That is right. All right. Now, I, you had told us this when we talked one time uh, over at the library in Rouse's Point, and, and I was talking with Peg Barcombe, and I mentioned it to her. I said, <laughs> if this wasn't silly, Peg, I asked her if she knew that there was a, mar a marker on Rose Avenue. As if it was a big surprise to her. And she said, oh yes, she said that when she was the village historian, that it was in bad repair and it was leaning to one's way. And she wanted the permission from the village to straighten it. And they said they couldn't give her permission. Uh, the permission would have to come from the federal government because it's owned by the federal government. So she contacted, she either wrote to somebody in Washington and asked if she could straighten it. And she either got a letter and or a call, but a telephone call was involved, and they didn't even know that there was a marker there. And they said, we can't give you permission on something we don't know about. So she took a picture and sent it to them and explained the whole thing. And she said that she would want uh, permission. She then got a phone call from a man, I've forgotten his name, in Ottawa, saying he didn't know about it. And he should have because the other side of the stone belongs to Canada as the 45th parallel. And uh, he came down, she took a picture, he came down and a long story shorter, they finally gave her permission to, to do some work on it to kind of straighten it up a little bit. But it's been there and I never heard of it, and I'm sure many people in Rounds this point have never seen this marker. And don't go bother Surreal too much. Look at it from the sidewalk or wait till summer. <laughs> go ahead, Dal. As you said, it's very easy to see from the sidewalk because uh, uh, those two photos were taken from the sidewalk. Yeah. Now, this one, by the way, is taken from the north side looking toward the village, I believe. This is from the backyard. That's right. Looking toward the uh, road that was on the other side of this picture, and this road avenue is looking from, this is the north side, and you're looking at it here from the south side. Correct? Yes. It has to be, because that's mm -hmm. the house yeah. toward the village. Okay. And uh, you see, again, you're learning something that's right there in Rouse's Point. Now, did you also have these same signories all the way across the state? Uh, as you go west? In other words, uh, this is only as far as Paris built. It was more as part of the signory given by, by the French government way back? Uh, there was, oh yes, there was some signory, but uh, between signories there was uh, like the crown land, which became later uh, known as the townships. Okay, so it, it, it was still, like when they gave this back to the government, that never was given to anybody. They didn't have to give it back. It, it stayed with the crown. That is right. All right. All right, now we have a picture here. If this is in your way, I don't know what you have in mind here, how we're going to do this, but this is another uh, picture, uh, a map rather. If we can just fasten this here to show you. And again, uh, this is the lake in through the, up through here, and south and north. And uh, yeah, are these, these two signories on this map? Oh yes, they're situated right here. Okay. The Seigneury of the Laurent okay. and Seigneury de Beaujeu. By the way, this one was called Seigneury of La Colle. On the count, as you can see here, Rivière à la Colle. As you can see, uh, north of this, there was a Seigneury de Deliri, and then if we're coming south of, the, uh, of those two Seigneuries, Seigneury of the Monsieur Péan, then the Seigneury of Monsieur La Gauchetière, and finally, that on this map here, the Seigneury of the Monsieur de Saint Vincent. So, if you can see by this notation there, Point à la Grosse Roche, so you would have Plattsburgh. Uh, it's Point Roche. And this here is Kings Bay, yeah. and that's that's uh, Point of Fair right here. Right. That's where you're located. These are the two Shazy rivers, the big, the big Shazy and the little Shazy, where it comes out. It gives you an idea where you're at. This is Vermont over here. All right. Uh, you, 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 it's your story. When do we go from here? Okay, then we'll change completely. This. Okay, while we're changing, we'll take a short break and come right back. You're uh, going to learn a lot more. We're going to get into some uh, uh, stories and some names of, of people going back and forth across the border here, from Canadians to Americans along the way. And we'll find some meanings maybe of some of the names. And uh, uh, you're going to be putting something else back on the board, or we're going to keep right on talking. We can keep right on talking, I guess.
Okay. Uh, is it, is it, what we're going to talk about now, is it true that the French regime is done as far as what we're going to talk about now? We're talking English? That is right. The, the British. The okay. British okay. From yeah. now on, the French yeah. regime is finished in, in Canada at, based on uh, 1763. That's right. right. All right. And what we're talking about now uh, also is after the American Revolution when the okay. two countries were divided. Mm -hmm. So if we go by this uh, uh, document that you see, 205 years ago, the Odell family from the Duchess County in New York moved on this side of the border. And this is the deed that was given to them. And as you can, if you could read what it says here, uh, that was uh, that the uh, uh, Gabriel Christie, Major General, who was the senior at the time, he gave the authority to Joseph Odell and his sons to settle on the land that they were occupied for the last few uh, weeks probably or a few months. And this document here started on the first day of June 1788. And the land from the border as we know it today, just opposite White's Corner on the Odell Town Road, all that land way down north, about a mile and a quarter, was given in concession by the Senor of the Time, Gabriel Cristi, to the Odell family. And this, as I was saying before, that was from the, uh, the provincial line, from the uh, opposite White's Corner, Route 276 on your side, Route 221 in Canada, leading to the village of Lacole, but it was known then, and this is still known by a lot of historians and people uh, of a certain age, by the name of Odell Town Road. If you want to look at this, let's just remove this. Okay. This is the coat of arms of the Odell family at different time of their history. You mean it changes? The Lord of arms change? Yes, but as Robert was uh, talking to me before you arrived, uh, Bob, that they still maintain the three points here. See, three points here, mm -hmm. the three points here. Do you know the significance of those three points? Uh, no, yes, I, I really think. don't know it, but uh, we will have uh, something uh, soon. Uh, on the Odell family okay. and the building that we are here. Okay. Odell, that's O-D-E-L-L, -L. there's no apostrophe, it's a straight O-D-E-L-L. -L. Uh, yes? Bob would like to mention that's something. Three points of fellowship. Three points of fellowship, okay. And Masonic. So that, oh, the Masonic. That's right. There's so there's a Masonic in involved in the, in the family crest. That's right. That's the Masonic. Okay, three all right. I believe. That's what you believe that's what it is? Okay. Yeah. And even though it's shaped a little bit different in each one, yeah. it still has the three points, which is the significance. And of course, they're usually colored. The, the colors here probably uh, they don't show, but uh, they have a color for each of the different things, and that's part of your crest. And we all have those that when we're from uh, uh, arist or an aristocrat. I was looking at my coat of arms yesterday, down talking with a relative. Okay. What did they do with a coat of arms? Uh, Oh, it was something, you know, uh, of noble families. Did they wear it on, their, on, on a vestment? Did they uh, oh, have it in front of their house? Well, uh, on all their uh, documentation they had. They had it all documentation? Yes. Yeah. And some of them were even using them on their seal. Okay. You know, then when yeah. they were sending letters or signing mm -hmm. documentation of, uh, of importance, they were putting the seals on, and it was the uh, emblem of the, uh, their coat of arms. Mm -hmm. So this uh, Joseph Odell that we're talking about, uh, he was a captain of the 1st Battalion Townships before the American War, between against the British colonies 1812-1814 and until his death. And he was a provincial from the Provincial Secretary's office in May the 3rd, 1809, from Quebec, uh, he was appointed uh, as uh, Justice of the Peace, and he was uh, Justice of the Peace for the District of Montreal from April the 22nd, 1809 until his death again. Joseph Odell Jr. 
uh, uh, Esquire to try causes under the statute 48 uh, George 3rd chapter 15 in the seigneuries of Bourges and Delury and this was signed April the 25th 1809 and Joseph Odell was an ardent mason where did he live did he live in this house now this house here, which is the next subject, okay. was built as a store. Okay. He lived right across the street. Right across from where Odell right lived. Out. That is right. He had, in 1801, he had uh, a colonial mansion house built for himself and his family. And he lived right across uh, on the, the west side of the road uh, from the border leading to uh, the village of Lacombe. Do you know whether this land on this farm that Bob owns here, Robert Boyce owns, was this land cleared at that time? Or was it all trees and it was cleared later? Have you any idea? Oh, no, it was not cleared. Then. It was all trees, right? Oh, yes. You had to clear it. Yes. You, know, you just didn't, didn't find farmland. It was, you had to take the trees, pull the stumps, and make another acre or so once every two or three years, correct? Oh, yes. And in, in, in documents through the histories, you will find out uh, that there was a lot of... Uh, Potash trees. Yes, yes. And uh, Robert could show you later on exactly where the potash tree was on this side of the uh, the road, and alongside here, not very far, about maybe a uh, quarter of a mile. There was another potash tree. There was potash tree all over. Now they. This is where you. It was something like making. Uh, uh, what I want to say for when you when you have your barbecues. Uh, What's the word I want? Uh, charcoal. Charcoal. It, they, they took wood, and that's what they, they made. They got potash from the wood when they burned, right? Yes. They, they, what they were doing when they cleared the land here, they were burning all the woods that they could not use for building purposes, for instance. And that ash, they were uh, boiling that ash and uh, with other ingredients in it. And uh, mostly, they were using it uh, to uh, make soap. For instance, okay, and then this was uh, it was more uh, it was worth more than cash then, because uh, there was all kind of money involved at different time uh, period of the story here, yeah. but the the uh, the potash was uh, a valuable uh, substance then. They could trade that in a a anywhere, all over. We're not far from the Richelieu River from here, huh? so they were putting that in big barrels and transporting that to the river on flat boat or what they used to call bateau going down to uh, St. John's for instance exchanging uh, their uh, barrels of uh, potash for uh, goods they need uh, to live in. John Ross told once on TV I heard years ago there were a lot of asheries and potash made from Champlain down to Chez there were one every two or three four miles there was a lot oh, of yeah. places that were yeah. they were they were not oh. uncommon they were nearly like farms today. Okay, so we go on to the Odells come in for the first time. Yeah, so we have them established that they were here 205 years ago. So now we, there's a subject that... Uh, Are there still Odells in the area? Uh, by the name of Odell, no, no. But there's Odell descendants. They are, okay. Yeah, like the Robinsons, for instance. Uh, you can find... Uh, 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 Beside the Robinsons, uh, the Van Vliet, with, uh, through uh, marriage. With these Robinsons you talk about, would some of those Robinsons just over the border be part of that same Robinson family? Oh, yes. Possibly, they they oh, are. Yes. There's a lot of connection between, that's why we're here, there's a lot of connection between just over the border for 20 miles and uh, the, this southern part of Quebec. Joyce Lavois is a relative. Joyce Lavois is a relative of the... Uh, 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 the Odell. The Odell. That is right. Okay. And also, well, uh, while, we, while we were mentioning it, she's a uh, descendant of the Dewey family. The Dewey and the Odells, they're, uh, okay. that's close by. So they kept the inns on both sides of the border here and they, they, they got all the traffic. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Uh, Is there a hotel here too? Uh, well, they, they didn't call an them. An inn. An inn? Yes, they, they were calling them inn. If you go to a uh, different time of the uh, the seigneuries that we're discussing at the moment, uh, you will find uh, at least every uh, each period at least three inns or hotel, if you want to call it. So this one here served. Uh, it was not an inn by itself, but it served. They, they were serving meals or uh, 
alcohol beverage is there on uh, different occasions. But not far from here, uh, close to the old town church, there was the uh, William W. Fisher's Inn, and there was the Scriver's Inn, and uh, another one in La Colle, uh, Oliver's Inn. They were small, right? But yes. there were a lot of them. Yeah, because they were small. The, the, people did not stay overnight like uh, they do today. Huh? They were traveling by a stagecoach, for instance. Or when the postal uh, uh, coach was going by, uh, sometimes they had passengers. So they were stopping to have something to eat and uh, drink. And uh, uh, Dewey's Tavern, that we just mentioned, uh, it served about the same pur purpose as this one here. Mm -hmm. Because you've got to remember that you didn't leave here in the morning with your stagecoach or with your horses and, and arrive at Albany that night. It just didn't work that way. Oh, no. You were lucky to get from here to Plattsburgh probably, right? That was a long trip, 20 yes. miles? Well, on account, oh yes, I'd say uh, if they could travel from 30 to 40 miles a day, that was the best uh, <laughs> that they could do. Because on account of the, uh, the roads. Yeah. And uh, there's a mention somewhere in, uh, in uh, documentation talking about this old town road. It was to be, uh, that was the one uh, that perfect as far as road were concerned then. That was the best road uh, to travel. Mm -hmm. And as a matter of fact, if we're talking about this road here, that was the fir first main road, paved main road from uh, Montreal to New York. It was known then as the King Edward Highway. When I started across custom in 1948, we mentioned a little while ago, uh, right here in the old town. 45 years ago, uh, well, it was known as Route uh, 9A. Then it was changed to what we know it as Route 221 now. Well, if you arrived here, you had to come from somewhere. Where were you born? <laughs> oh, well, I was born in Saint Scholastic. And uh, as uh, every uh, immigration officer on the U.S. side, they look at me when I say I that. Just, yeah. And uh, I, I just tell them, you know, where the uh, Mirabel Airport is. Saint Scholastic is part of the part of Saint Scholastic uh, was expropriated to build this uh, Mirabel. It uh, sounded like a school. Is it Scholastic? Is that what it means? Uh, no, Saint, no, no, no. It was a girl's name. Oh, all right, a girl's name. Okay, now we're. Well, we know where Dewey's Tavern is, but not everybody reviewing. Those. Okay, yeah. Tell us where Dewey's Tavern is. Well, compared to here, it's south of here, so. Uh, where we are at the moment, there we are about a mile uh, north of the border, and the Dewey Tavern would be about three quarters of a mile to a mile south of the border. Right on the corner near the NCCS school, up at, on a kitty corner, uh, at, at an angle, not uh, directly across, but just over. It's owned by Mr. and Mrs. Louis Bidard today, and it's on the Prospect, uh, Prospect Street Road, I guess it's called. Uh, and uh, 276 on the corner. Well known, it was taken over by the British uh, as a hospital and uh, other things, right? In 1812-13? Yep. That is right. 1819 rooms and smiling people who live there. Okay, now <coughs> this is where we, we are at the moment. So if you look at this photo here, like we said before, it's over, it was taken over 55 years ago. Well, this building was built in 1798, so that is 195 years ago, and it was built as a store. And uh, the uh, upstairs was occupied by the Freemason societies for many years. And as we mentioned, that uh, Joseph O'Dell was an ardent Mason. He gave he give them the authority the, to keep, to, uh, keep uh, the, uh, the upstairs of this door available to the uh, mason. That was the, uh, how do you call this, uh, Robert? Freemasons. Yeah, the Freemason, but Lodge. 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 That was one of the first Lodge of uh, Lower Canada then. As you know, <coughs> in the past, uh, we were uh, defining this area here as, uh, like at first, New France, and then when it came Canada, so they called that this part here was Lower Canada, or it, you can see documentation that will refer to East Canada. So the lodge 
of the Freemason. But this part here, uh, I was told, I haven't got the documentation on that, but I was told that was the first uh, lodge in Eastern Canada and occupying all the second floor of this building here. So I would have thought in years back that if you had a store you lived upstairs like they do today some places, but they didn't live up in this building at all. No, because it was built as a general store. And they lived in this nice place across the street. Right across the street there. And uh, during, uh, you know, the, the general stores, uh, they were using that for every occasion. Huh? People were coming down here uh, in the stores uh, to get whatever goods that they could buy or sometimes just to change, uh, exchange ideas about the, the crops or what to do on their farms and they exchanged a lot of ideas here also they could get their mail sometime or the, uh, sending their mail from this place here but there's one, at one point here we just mentioned a little while ago the uh, Dewey Tavern uh, during the, the war of 1812-1814, the American war against the British colonies there, uh, the General James Wilkinson of the American army occupied at one time this door here as a headquarter for his men. And the colonial mansion house that was built across the road here, he occupied it as its own headquarters. And at this time here, uh, just to talk a few seconds, uh, about the colonial mansion house, it was destroyed unfortunately in uh, 1923 during the American Prohibition time. And when uh, Mr. Uh, Sherwood Boyce, Robert's father, bought the place here, uh, he cleaned up the ruins of what was originally the colonial mansion house. And in the ruin, this cannonball here was found. And it is believed that it was left by General Wilkinson's army when he occupied this place here as his headquarters. You, you're not say, saying that it was probably shot and landed here. Oh, no, it was no, something no. they were carrying. That is right, yes, because the battle then right. of 1812, 1814 was about five miles north of here. So there was no bullet that, yes. was, that was fired. Right from any cannons down the, in this direction here. Were there any other roads coming down uh, into the Clinton County area along the, uh, the border where other soldiers would have come down? Or did they most, come, most of them come through here? Well, they, they, uh, most of them came down this road because it was the better road. But there's a, east of here, about a mile and a half from here, there's another road direct from Rouses Point to St. John's, for mm -hmm. instance. And uh, there's another road, the old, oldest road on the Signori here, uh, thousands of years ago, the uh, Indians were using uh, this path to go by, and that's the road that leads to the uh, Champlain. Do you know that the, uh, uh, I don't remember the name of the street. Oak Street. Oak Street. Oak Street. Street. Yeah. That's right. Goes yeah. up to St. Bernard, you mean? That is right. right. So that, that what we know now as uh, St. Andre's Road. Mm -hmm. It was, that was the, as far as I know, through documentation, that was the oldest uh, uh, road mm -hmm. then. Uh, and of course, the, the oldest road is the uh, Lake Champlain and the Richelieu River. Yes. But by land, those are the three main roads. Now, I don't know, you were mentioning uh, earlier, Robert, with me, we were looking out the window, that at one time there were stables in the back and they changed horses here? For the stagecoach. For the stagecoach. Now, was that about the time that he's talking? Yeah. In the early 1800s, like oh, that? Yes. And there were, there were stables here? And the horses had to be changed about every 10 miles. And I was, I a good horse would walk four miles an hour. So that by every two and a half hours, they had to change horses. The other place they changed horses was at Naperville. Let's say that again so that to make an impression here. A horse can walk about... A good horse will walk four miles an hour. Four miles an hour, all right. And they didn't run them very much, they walked them. They had to walk. That's a long time. Isn't it? They walked four miles an hour, and about two and a half hours, they would change the horses. And the horses would rest a couple of hours or however long, and then, and then that driver would take another team on. <coughs> And then there'd be some another stagecoach come later or something yeah. that same day, and then he'd pick up the same horses? Whatever, yeah. 
these stage coaches will take it. They would take. They would leave a team off, teams off, and they would take another team on. And they were owned by the stage coach. That I don't know. Uh, probably owned by the stage coach people, or they rented them one or the other. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, all right. Then we're right in the back of here. All That's right. right. We're we're really sitting right in the middle of a very very historic building. Oh, it is. As far as I, I am concerned, so far, this is the oldest building built on the seigniory of La Col Beaujeu that still exists. There might be others, but I haven't found and that's, documentation on that. And that's roughly nine by six miles. That's 54 square miles of land. You said that that uh, seigneury de Beaujeu was nine miles by six miles in size? Oh yes, well originally it oh, was six it, miles. Oh, you know, it was, uh, and then it made a double. Yeah, six miles uh, uh, alongside of the river and the Lake Champlain. You had two of them originally, and then uh, it became one. One, so, then so you, you got twelve, 12 miles, miles, nearly a hundred square miles. hundred and eight, hundred yeah. and eight uh, square, square miles. miles. Yeah. And it's the oldest building in that area, you're saying. We know that in Champlain, I think one of the oldest buildings in the village of Champlain is around eighteen, eight or nine. Okay. Okay. Just to give you uh, a rough idea of what was a uh, general store in that time, as you can see, all the goods. I cannot go through the inventory because it would take too long. But I will get a copy for Robert of all the goods that were found in this store here uh, when Joseph Hotel died in 1824, and you would be amazed of all the goods they had. And there's another view of another general store. Yeah, it was, it was and it, see they had drawers. And mm -hmm. and you know, it's only in the last, as a matter of fact, I can remember, and I'm, I'm not that old regardless of what my people out there think, that I can remember that you didn't help yourself when you went into stores. Everything was behind the counters and they would go get it for you and bring it and then they'd say, well, if you want, he'd go and come back, you know. That's and right. so that you're talking maybe 50 years ago, 60 years ago, there was no self-service. Right. You didn't have all these things up and down the aisle. It was a big innovation. And they weren't anywhere near the size they are now. And uh, this store, as you know then, as a general store, uh, all kind of, uh, of uh, deals were uh, going through them. Uh, in this store here, I found many documentation uh, that was signed by notaries, you know, where they, there was a deed of sale or a donation and all that. This is this store here was uh, one of their main places that they were coming. I'll give you an example here. Uh, the uh, the deed of donation by Richard Jackson uh, unto the uh, inhabitants of Oval Town of a burial ground known as the Jackson Cemetery was done and signed here in this store on March of 27, 1827. And now, Joseph Odell, Jr., he died on March the, tw the 30th, 1824, and is buried in the Jackson Cemetery. So he was buried in the Jackson Cemetery before it was given to the inhabitants of the... Uh, so it was like, uh, say, a family uh, burial grounds, but friends around, they were buried there. We're in uh, Odeltown and we're talking about our heritage and the, the culture it came just across from the border on the Canadian side. We'll come right back and while we do, we'll focus on this cannonball as we go off and take a short break. Uh, found in the ruins of the uh, Odell Colonial Mansion. Colonial Mansion yeah. House. How do you pronounce it? Colonial, Colonial Mansion, Mansion House across House. the road. Uh, please stay with us, we'll be right back. Welcome back. I'm Bob Van, Robert Boyce on my left, and to our right here is Jean Lebrun. It means Brown, the easy way. John Brown. John Brown, yeah. The famous John Brown. Yeah. Not that one. <coughs> Not that one. All right, you're going to give us a little history of this house, who's owned this house over the years? Okay, as uh, we, we talked there a little while ago, uh, that Joseph Hotel was the owner of this land, and he had this uh, general store built in uh, 1798. At, uh, when he died in 1824, it were down to two of his sons, Iron Motel and John Motel. And after that, <laughs> a son of John Motel, by the name of Henry Kenfield Odell, uh, owned this place from April the 6th, 1882. 
and after that it was a, a, a niece of Henry Canfield Odell by the name of Sarah Janet Odell that owned this place from January 11th 1913 she sold this uh, property here to Harry F. Smith on December 5th 17, 1917 and then Sherwood Boyce bought this place on May the 15th, 1926. Yeah, that's Robert's father? That's right. Yeah, that's your father. All and right. finally, Robert Boyce from March the 6th, 1975 to today. Okay, now, you mentioned that your grandfather was here before, but not at this location? No, this location. I bought a quarter of a mile down the road. Okay, that's the road heading east. It's not the road that we're on, but it's the road heading east. east. Uh, that was, a, and then, he wanted this land also, of course, he was right adjoining the farm, so he set up his son here, basically. Basically. Dad borrowed money from the, from his father to get started. Something like that's that. what happens, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. that's right. That's what happens along, that's what they, that's usually a French way of doing You're English, Robert? That's right. You're English. English. Now, we talked a little bit about ca off camera, is this the time to do it or not? That is good. Uh, 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 Robert, you mentioned at one time that there were very few French in this area that's right. And it would seem just the opposite to us. And we would yeah. think that the English should be on the American side and the French were here. There's a lot of French names. French, but it wasn't. They were English. What's the story? Can you give me a little story on that? Or you, Jean? What's the story? Jean can do a better job. Jean can do a better job. A better speaker. <laughs> oh, don't say that. Don't say that. You both smiled so well, you should both be on TV at once. <laughs> Well, we have to go back to where, when we were talking about the uh, seigneury of La Colle Boucher up until the American Revolution. Uh, that seigneury, uh, La Colle Boucher, uh, really started to develop itself there right after the American Revolution. And if you know, if you look at documentation, you will find the names uh, of the uh, original pioneers coming down this way. They came, most of them came from the uh, Dutchess County in New York. You will see the names there, just a few that I can comes to my mind. The Odells, for instance, Mannings, Lewis, uh, later on Robinson, uh, so on. The, m most of those people were, of course, uh, Eng of uh, uh, English uh, origin, and they came from uh, the Dutch Dutchess County. So, at the beginning, English people let's say from 1785 on, it was English. All right, now you mentioned, well, again off camera, what we were just talking and then no particular order, but you mentioned about a buffer zone. Tell us a little bit about that ph philosophy you have. But before we do that, uh, you mentioned that this home here nice. at, in the early 1900s, that some people were renting or were living here and had some children that we know. That's right, it's the Marnes family. Marnes. Ruth, Ruth L. Edgerton. Yes. Which her daughter lives in Rogers Point. They used to own the M. Ken Motel. Yes. And the Charlie Marnes family. <coughs> Arnold Marnes family. I believe you still have a George Marnes living in Rogers Point. Right. And they were living here and they moved from here to Rogers Point. So you think Ruth was born here? I believe Ruth was born here. And, uh, right here in, uh, so they were Americans up here renting? Or were they Canadian maybe? I believe they were Canadians. I can't they, sure. yeah. they were Canadians. They were Canadians? Yes, I worked uh, some of the uh, genealogy and uh, she was born here and a few generations ahead of her were born here. Okay, so we've got some connection with Rouse's Point and this famous building we're in. And by the way, we have to let Robert speak once in a while because he owns the building. You know when you play baseball? And you got to give a guy his right because he owns the bat. Well, he owns the building, and we got to we got to go along with him. Thanks, Robert. <laughs> okay, Jeff. You were, I was talking about this buffer zone. Then you had a philosophy on that. Well, you will not find that in writing. No, well, you're right. Through right. documentation that uh, that you can find something sometimes that gives you ideas like that. Uh -huh. After the American Revolution, huh, you know that the, uh, there's a lot of uh, Canadians. Or people residing on Canadian uh, soil fought for the American cause and in uh, exchange after the war the American government gave them a grant of uh, land as you know like they, they, they what they call the uh, Champlain 
the town of Champlain. It was divided uh, by sectors given to the, uh, the French uh, sector, for instance, the Acadian uh, and the militaries that fought, people that fought for the American cause. And uh, on the Canadian side here, as we mentioned uh, before, it was developed here right after that, uh, somewhere from 1785, you can see documentation, concession of uh, grants of lands around. And most of the people that you can see, especially alongside the border here, what they call the uh, south part of the, 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 the domain of the seigneuries, uh, were given into a concession. Uh, m most of the names that I know so far were all uh, American people or living on the American soil before. And uh, they were, most of them were from the Dutchess County, like the Odell, for instance, Lewis uh, Manning, Scribers, uh, Robinson, and so on. And uh, with this in mind, I figured that the Right after the American uh, Revolution, uh, people on both sides uh, then were, a lot of them, uh, in power, in the government, uh, they were of British uh, origin, so they thought about the same way. So I figured what they did is, like the, uh, the American, they said, we'll give grant of land to the uh, people from uh, Canada that fought for our cause, but we'll give them close to the, the border. And that's what happened on this side too. People like uh, on your side, uh, that in your history, uh, you will refer to them as Tories or Loyalists. So they came to establish themselves in Canada. So the government, Canadian government then said, okay, we'll put them in township, especially close to the border. So if there's any conflict between those two our two countries later on, there will be the persons like uh, to absorb the shock there uh, during mm -hmm. that conflict. You know, an awful lot of people in our Champlain and Rogers Point area uh, have relatives and uh, th their beginning was right here in Canada. The French, you know, a lot of French oh, yes. names, a lot oh, of, yes. you know, from everything from the I, I, Trombley, is that Trombley, the, the, uh, all the Lavois, and the, all the French names I could name. And we're going to get into some of those a little bit later, but now we sing a church here. And a traveling priest? Yes. Yeah, I see this church here. We have to go back uh, to the church itself. This is the old old town church. Uh, a video cassette was made in that church there in 1988. Uh, by the way, uh, Calvin will oh. remember that. Uh -huh. And uh, <coughs> this church here was the first church to be built on the territory of the uh, Seigneury of La Col Beaujeu. And uh, this, uh, uh, the land on to which this uh, church was built in 1823 was given by Roswell Canfield to the British Wesleyan Methodists in Oval Town. And the, the erection of this building started in 1823. And you, you, were, you made a reference of names. So I will give you the names of the people that signed that deed. But this is not a Catholic church. Is it? Oh no. Well, oh, I said Catholic church. You gotta be careful. That's not a priest either. No, no. All right. So this is a Methodist. Methodist. Oh yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, yes. Now, but this is the first church of any de denomination built on the Seigneury of La Col Beaujeu, and this is the the Wesleyan Methodist uh, congregation. So Roswell can't feel he gave the piece of land to build this church on, and. Uh, the Reverend James uh, Boot accepted for the, the congregation along with Richard Jackson, Cornelius Van Vliet, Isaac Smith, Thomas Hewson, Richard Harper, William Van Vliet, John Wilson Jr., James Gordon, and witnesses were James Goslin, William Scribers. So I'm um, Reading those names for you because you mentioned there's a lot of people. Oh yeah, some of those names we can, rec we can recognize. The Scribers and the Goslins uh, mm -hmm. certainly are, are two I pick up very quickly. Okay, so uh, I'm showing you this picture mm -hmm. here because this is uh, the, the the photo of a uh, saddle. Uh, they, they used to call him saddlebag preacher. 
the one in charge of the Old Town Circuit. The Old Town Circuit was not only Old Town. Yeah? At one time, it was going up all the territory occupied now by Hemingford, Sherrington, uh, Naperville, uh, going up even to uh, Chambly. All the way down on the uh, following uh, the Richelieu River, and they were replacing during the absence of the minister in Rouses Point and Champlain also. So this photo here represents uh, when the, the, the preacher was going from his church on the fourth night to visit his territory. You're telling me that that's the only church that was in that whole area that you just mentioned? At that time. At that time. At that time of the uh, Protestant uh, right. denomination. Right. You had some Catholic yeah. church, but outside of the Seigneurie of La Col Bourgeois. Well, the, the Protestants that were a minority are, and still are in Quebec, aren't they? Yes. Yes. Oh, yes. Okay. Okay. This, uh, this church, we will not talk too long about that. Okay. Because uh, there will be something right uh, after that that will involve the, uh, the church uh, itself. But in this church, you find a lot of documentation uh, that is uh, open to the public during the summer month, the month of the uh, July and August. This church here is open to the public. It's not open during the winter? Or? Uh, no, not to the public. This church here, uh, to reserve the right, according to the, the, uh, the deed of don uh, donation of the land to build this church on, they have to have at least one service a year to keep the, uh, uh, the status of a religious uh, site. Uh, and uh, in the month of June, I believe the last Sunday of June, the con congregation have their uh, service and at, this, at the same time they have a picnic. Where do they have their services now when they're not in here? They in, in the village of Lacole. In Lacole we'll show, show you later okay. on there's another church All right. of this di di domination. Uh, there was something I wanted to say. Now there's no bell in the in the bell not this one. No, not, not in this one. There was never any bell that as I know of. Because, because that when they built that uh, steeple, it was not strong enough to hold the bell. The bell. So that's why there was never a bell put in that. Uh, uh, I guess the steeple signifies a church, and so they don't all have to have a bell, right? It indicates that that's a church. Or otherwise, I guess without that, you wouldn't necessarily know it's a church. You know, uh, uh, someone would yeah. tell you. But you know, the, the bell was good there, like in a, a village, for instance. Uh, this one is uh, when it was built. It was way in the country uh, from here. Uh, it's exactly, I would say, um, uh, a mile and a half north of here, on the same road. So, the people then uh, were living, you know, the, 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 the property, the concession were given uh, four acres wide by a mile long. So, the, 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 the neighbors weren't as close as they are today. So, a belt would not have been uh, of any use then, even there. So, you, uh, based on what Robert told us, if it's a mile plus from here, and four miles an hour for a horse, you're talking 15 minutes plus in your, in your buggy or your sleigh to get to church. That's right. right? That's right. It wasn't as easy then, and I think even though it wasn't easy, they went to church more than they do now. That's right. Right? That's right. <laughs> Too easy for us now. That's right. These right. Have a, that was a social... Yeah, well, that is true. That. that is true. Yes, communities and areas built around that because that was the, uh, the center. In the back of the church uh, sheds, and you can still see the stove pipe hole where they used to make the chicken pot suppers and things. Something to look forward to. Yeah. Right. And this is the church? Yes, this is an aerial uh, view of this old little town church that was taken in uh, 1988. This is going north, this direction? That is right. Okay. And that is the road from the church leading uh, east to the river. Does that come out anywhere near Cantic? No. Oh, well, uh, yes. It does in that general area? Oh, yes, right. that's right. 
So how much land does the church own? Do they own this whole area? Oh, no, no, no. It was just just uh, the, the just plot itself. Uh, yeah, that's right. Just a quarter of an acre uh, square yeah. acre that they uh, that was given to them for that purpose only. Well, what road is this? I don't know. That's familiar with that road. That's the road to Saint Bernard. No, uh, it, it it will lead you to Saint Bernard. Saint Bernard. Bernard huh? Yeah, J just about let's see, a mile and uh, well, at the most, a mile from here. Uh, you can take this road here to go down. This road here can lead you to St. Bernard. It's I parallel did. to this one. I didn't realize there was a road that, that close oh, yeah. to this one. Okay. Th this road here, uh, uh, during the uh, Canadian Rebellion in 1837-1838, it was referred as the back road. And in and this photo, you cannot see it, but just about here, there is the... Uh, an old burial ground that they, it, it referred to as the Odell Town uh, burial ground or the Dumas burial ground. Well, how big of an area was Odell Town? They talk about Odell Town. I'm sure people out there have talked about it. So it's a, from here to the border. Is that all Odell Town? Oh yeah. No. Oh yes. Uh, and went, went to the village of Lacol. You right? would say. Oh yeah. You'd say uh, uh, about five miles. Okay. And it wasn't. A, it didn't have a government, did it? Oh no no. It was no. just a location. That is uh, right. like a parish mill or a Cooperville. That it's is, an area. Yes, it was uh, like uh, it was not a village by itself because uh, the, there was not like uh, a postmaster. Uh, but then there was, there was no government. Uh, no, as such. not as okay. such. Not as such. It was part of the. Uh, it became part of the uh, municipality of uh, Saint Bernard of La Cole. Why would you have a community named St. Bernard called St. Bernard and Lacole? Is that because there's a township called Lacole? Why would it be St. Bernard and Lacole when it's also a Lacole? Well, St. Bernard of Lacole, you know that that, that is a French uh, way of doing it. They, when they, make, they were making, uh, erecting a uh, parish, for instance, huh? oh. they were giving a saint's name to that parish. So uh, they could uh, have used St. Bernard. As a matter of fact, there's at least three other places in the province of Quebec that is of the St. Bernard. So it's St. Bernard of Lacole, okay. on account of the uh, Lacole River and the Seigneurie of Lacole. And it's got a designation. Yeah, okay. Okay. designation uh, as such. And of course, there, there's a parish and a municipality was were taking the same name then. Okay. And this is the cemetery back in no, 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 the cemetery is more uh, about here. In way back there? Yeah. Oh, it wasn't near the church at all? No. Oh, okay. no, no. No, because see, then it, it, they were uh, uh, like family uh, owned burial ground, which later on were given to the uh, society or the. Uh, are you in, in, are in this area, are there, is there a Catholic cemetery and a, and a Protestant cemetery, or is it a community cemetery? Oh, no. you, you, you have, uh, on the Oral Town Circuit that I mentioned a little while ago, uh, there's uh, 12 different uh, Protestants. Oh, you can't, you can't be buried together? Well, I don't see why not. Well, no, but they don't. No, they don't. They said right. It was not a practice, right. but you will find some French ex-Catholic, if you want, buried in uh, mm -hmm. those uh, Protestant cemeteries around. So on the on this territory, uh, I was saying there was 12 uh, Protestant uh, or non-Catholic, if you want, uh, burial grounds. And also there is at least uh, two Catholic uh, burial grounds. Mm -hmm. The one in the village of Lacole and the one in uh, St. Bernard of Lacole. Okay, we'll be right back. You're watching uh, History of the Past with uh, Bob Venn, who's too young to understand all of this, but he's talking to Jean Lebrun and to Robert uh, Boyce, and if, uh, he's told me I'm even older than Robert Boyce here. I can see that. He was born in 1936. Oh, my gosh. It, it, ten years after his father bought this place. Yeah. Okay, we'll be right back. Thanks for tuning in to Hometown Cable. And If you like these programs and uh, you have ideas, why don't you get a hold of... Uh, Calvin, uh, he's always willing to uh, get out and try to do what you want to see. As he said before, tell him where to go. The trouble is, too many people tell him where to go, and they don't always send the twelve dollars either. We're talking, of course. Uh, we're just above the border, as, as to make sure you understand. 
Uh, when you go up past the school, go up about a mile, less than a mile, you're on the Canadian border, and you can turn uh, east and go over to around this point, or you can come into La Colle. And we're only about a mile north of that spot. It's the third place on the right as you, after you leave the Customs House. And Bob was telling us that your grandfather back in the 1800s was the only Frenchman in this area? The only Englishman that could speak French. The only Englishman that could speak French? It's French. But there were a lot of Frenchmen here? No. Oh, no, there were? There were. He was the only Englishman that come here from Dalson in 1898 and settled on the uh, original Boyce farm. And the only Frenchman was here was Mr. Martin, lived on the Rogers Point, St. John's Road. And my grandfather, he used to have conversations that lasted half a day in French. You wouldn't expect the name Boyce to be talking French very often, not generally, would you? That's right. Do you speak much French? I can get along. You can get along? I can get along. I can get along too. We can get along together. <laughs> uh, but at that time, a lot of, there was a lot of French being spoken just on the other side of the border. That's and right. you would expect it just the reverse, right? But, and there was mostly English in here at that time, and then the, even the English was because he came from Delson. Delson, uh, Delson, what's Delson famous for you people out there? What's Delson? Well, Delson was a, like uh, a depot for the... Uh, the train. The train. The trains, right. I think it's, that, that, isn't that where the Napierville Junction uh, yeah. starts their tracks and goes all the way up into, into Montreal? Yes, yeah, we heard that from, guess who? Peg Barcombe told us that. And, we don't always remember it completely exact. All right, so you uh, you didn't continue the French. Did your father speak a lot of French when he was here? My father, yes, he, he could speak French. But mm -hmm. did he? Did he speak? He did, yes. All right. Yes. yes he but did the it, but it is unusual as Calvin was picking out as we were talking here is that on the Canadian side, which is not with the French, he was speaking English, and on the other side, which was in the U.S., he was speaking French. Wow. And there's a lot of French being spoken in Champlain. Well, my ancestors all came from England. My great grandmother was Sherwood from Sherwood Forest. In England, Nottingham. So, Which, did she did she know Robin Hood? I believe her. There was some connection in there. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're we're still in Old Town. We're back in Old Town, and we we got another new picture on the on the wall. It looks like we're going to talk about fighting. Uh -huh. Yeah, a hundred and fifty-five years ago, in November exactly, November ninth, eighteen thirty-eight. It was the last battle fought of the Canadian Rebellion, and it was fought, like you see, in the church and around the church of Old Town that we have seen previously. Right. Well, and could you take a minute or two to tell me what the Canadian Rebellion was? I, I should know, but I don't. Well, it was, uh, at first, sir, uh, it was a, a political uh, gang, in other words, that were uh, French Canadians. And uh, they uh, didn't want to go along with the, the British on everything. And uh, the British uh, were governing the, the French then, their ways. Not what was uh, they, like the French were entitled to. And uh, the Canadian Rebellion in itself, it was to have the government recognize and uh, give apply the regulations then uh, on uh, on the French as well as the, the English. It was a protest as much as anything? It, it wasn't was a, a revolution? No, 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 that is, why, no that is why they call it a rebellion. Were there a lot of people involved in the French Canadian? Uh, there was a lot, but not not the majority. Okay. Oh no, not the majority of the Can the French Canadians. Okay. I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I wasn't sure. No, okay. no, that is good because All right. there, there, there's a lot that could be said on that. That unfortunately we don't have the time for it. It was restricted to Quebec. Yeah, only in oh Quebec. no, oh no, the Canadian Rebellion uh, uh, affected the low, uh, low, the lower and upper Canada. There was a lot of uh, English uh, Canadian uh, that uh, went along with the. Uh, the, uh, the uh, Canadian Rebellion. You know what I'm going to do when I get home? I'm going to get my encyclopedia. I'm going to look up about the Canadian Rebellion. And if you're more interested, or as interested as I am, do the same thing. And when you see Jean Lebrun, if you got any questions after reading that story, get back to him. Robert Boyce, too. Even though he's English, uh, his father, grandfather spoke French. <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, yeah. What we can see, what we can see here on this, there, that the, the volunteers and the the militia of the time, they uh, fought the uh, and defeat the Canadian patriots. 
uh, the, the French Canadian, depending on what side or who is writing the history of the uh, this rebellion, they will call the French will call the uh, the French Canadian patriot, but the English call them rebels. So the Fr the the, uh, the Canadian patriots were defeated, and by the way, this is the last battle fought of that rebellion of 1837-1838. It was around, right, uh, around in, in the old little town church. It's a mile from here. Right? Exactly. Uh, it's about a mile and a quarter. Mm -hmm. Because it's exactly a mile from my place mm -hmm. and I am about a quarter of a mile from this place here. Mm -hmm. This photo here is a photo of Captain George Hay who was along with this gentleman here, Traver Van Vliet, who was, it's like a second in command. During that battle that you can see here going on, right in back of that church, there was a big orchard. And George Hay and his uh, ensign, Traver Van Vliet, both of them were in, in the orchard during that battle. This saber here, that mm -hmm. you can see, that right. this man here left it to his de descendant. And in the photo here, you can see the same saber that I'm holding here at the moment. Yeah? And On your left. Bob, or Robert Bob Helvich. He is a direct descendant of this uh, Captain George mm -hmm. Hay. And this saber is the ownership of this man here. He owned that now. Yeah. So this is the saber that you can see in this photo here. Mm -hmm. That that man was right behind the church. In 1838. Yeah. The last battle of the Canadian Rebellion. Mm -hmm. A piece of history. This saber, uh, the uh, scabbard. 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 Uh, I didn't realize that it was it's leather. That's right. And, and it's pliable. Uh huh. Well, I thought they were more permanent than that. I didn't realize that the leather is held up real well. No, which is uh, oh yes, that is a, a fine quality, as you can see. Uh huh. And you know when they were using it, uh, yeah, when they were using their saber in a battle, if this was had been very stiff, it would be uh, how do you say? That would, that would be an, an obstacle to the yeah, men okay. fighting, yeah. because with this, the the the, 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 the sword out of this uh, of his uh, scabbard here, mm -hmm. so you will have the scabbard as you can see. That it scabbard is pretty low. Yeah, but of course this is is uh, some the uh, oh okay uh, he parade got, uniform yeah, if okay. you want huh? parade right, uniform. Yeah. So, but when he was using it in, in the battle, it was fat higher, it was yeah. higher, yeah. Okay, that would kind of uh, uh, kind of tickle you, uh, huh? That sure would. That well, sure <laughs> God, imagine imagine yourself that because two days prior to this, that this man here, along with others, were in this store here, and yeah. they yeah they yeah. they they, they uh, organized uh, the battle of the, uh, the Bullis Farm, which is situated at about uh, oh, a quarter of a mile uh, from the border of uh, Rouse's Point. Those men walked around here, yeah. from here to there, about three miles to uh, through the woods to go and attack the, some of the uh, patriots that were stationed there. So you can imagine this man here having the sword here hanging on his side, running across yeah. the field yeah. and all that, going uh, over ditches, uh, under fences and all that. You'll notice how the hand was protected yeah. so that when a person, if you had a sword fight or, or a, the little clash they had, it wasn't too likely that it was going to slide down and take your finger off. You were you were protected back here. Where were these made? Were they made in uh, in France and uh, overseas? No, this one here uh, probably in England. In England, you, yeah. You can see that it was uh, George uh, the Fourth. Oh yeah, all right. It also says that on the. Uh, yeah, it's also the, the fourth on, yeah. on the blade itself. Mm -hmm. Because this man here was also a uh, an officer during the uh, American War, 1812-1814. Uh -huh. He was stationed in Montreal. 
And what is good to notice here, uh, Bob, is when you put it in the scabbard, this year, oh, so it will not be in your way. So when, when he was getting it out of the scabbard, all he's got to do flip is that down. flip this down, okay. to protect his thumb. Uh, I don't know if you got that on, you see this, this here will fold up, so on his side, and he flip it down to protect that part of his hand. There are not a lot of these around, obviously. I don't know. I, I, there's some in museum and all that, but privately, privately uh -huh. owned, there's very, very few of them. Okay. And this is a musket of the type that were used there during the battle also. Mm -hmm. And this one is the, the property of Robert Boyce, as you can see on yeah. the photo in your and hand. And you were very susceptible when you were reloading it, remember? Oh. <laughs> Someone's going to be shooting at you. It took a while. You had to oh, yeah. uh, You had to pull your little, uh, <coughs> this dad go down, yeah, push your, yeah. uh, your little, uh, your powder in, and then you had a little, uh, uh, you had to put your flit, and your flit was on top, and you had to pack it down and then put the ball in, and this is, uh, this is an old gun, and in this picture, you'll see that Bob Boyce on my left is on the right in this picture. And I was commenting that uh, Jean Lebrun in the middle, he was pretty well protected by these two people. One had a gun and the other one had a, a sword and neither, neither one of them knew how to use it. <laughs> but Jean thought he was well protected. <laughs> You were you were talking. Well, what, what what is it? where was this picture taken? It was taken in the Old Town Church uh, in uh, 1991. Uh, we had a panel uh, discussing the uh, the, the story of uh -huh. the, uh, this man here, and uh, also of another descendant of uh, Bob uh, Elvis. Every year we have new panels to have a new subject. You know. Remember, after you shot it, you had to put your rod back inside because if you moved 10 feet and didn't bring it with you, you're going to look funny out there trying to load the next shell, the next ball. But there's another thing too that you must uh, bear in mind, that uh, when it was very humid, after going through the operation of loading and all that, misfire because yes. the, the, the flint did not go. So they had to unload everything yep. and start all over again. Yep, the flint was... Uh, right, with, right here, it was hit, and when this would go down, it would cause the spark. There was a little hole that brought the uh, the spark down, that would light off the uh, the powder. The powder. Yeah, you know, I often wonder that you didn't have to be the best shot in the world when they lined up uh, shoulder to shoulder. It was hard to miss anybody when you when you fired a gun. <laughs> and I, I can't believe where they used to march, even in the Civil War, they were marching across uh, side by side, just running into this. And, and falling, you know, and it, uh, it's just hard to believe that they thought they could uh, fight in that, in that way. Of course, I'm not a strategist, but I looked at even I couldn't miss anybody. But you know, it's, uh, it's funny that you mentioned that, but there wasn't too many uh, people that were killed in that battle. Of course, there uh, on the side of the Patriot, it's very hard to get the documentation of everyone involved in it and uh, the ones that were killed. But uh, you could see that well, for the, from documentation on uh -huh. end, in the church itself, there was uh, five people that were killed altogether during the battle of on the ninth and the one at the Bullis Farm. So there was three and uh, two. Uh, That's all that were killed. Uh, yeah, hard to believe on, on that side. A lot of misfiring. There was a lot of moisture in the air. Uh, that yes, it. because uh, you can uh, you have to remember that during that battle. Uh, uh, it was on the 9th of November 1838 and if you remember in November we always have a little snowstorm yes. well during the battle that's what happened so you can imagine the people uh, that were lying against uh, in the back of the this fence here because what you see burning here there was two small uh, barns and uh, what they did the people from the church they sent somebody to torch up the the, the barns so there was oak hay and straws mm -hmm. and all that, so no time at all that the fire yeah. got. So that the rebels that were around trying to encircle the people in the church could not go any further uh, and they, they, were, they, they, they were behind uh, this stone fence. It was stone, part stone fence and part uh, wood fence. Huh? Did the Americans get involved in this rebellion at all? A little bit, indirectly, indirectly. How long did it last? 
give or take, from beginning to end uh, the rebellion? Well, less than two years. Oh, it was that long? Yeah, but but, but the, 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 the there wasn't that was not fighting okay. all along. Oh yeah. no, because uh, the if you're t thinking about the the fight themselves, there actually uh, you would have maybe about uh, maximum in two years uh, a period of uh, less than two months fighting, yeah. and it was not uh, was not a daily uh, mm -hmm. uh, fight. Okay, well, we're cleaning up the uh, uh, all the mess from our war. No, we're not re we're not ready yet. We're, we're not ready to pick up. This I would like to yeah to read a little bit here. Right after the battle, the Reverend Cooney, who was the minister at the time there of the, of the old town church, as uh, he was in the church during all the the fighting, huh? and uh, right after that, you could see him outside in a great cooler. He boiled potatoes and a carcass of a sheep and the men uh, that were in the fight in front and around the church sitting wherever they could with a piece of meat in one hand and a potato, potato in the other hand. Have you any idea in any of your records how many people were involved in the Battle of uh, Odal Town, counting both sides? Both sides at Battle of Odal Town here depending what you read but through documentation I would say there was uh, involved right in that battle mm -hmm. uh, at the maximum about 800 people. There was in the church and around the church, uh, it, is, it has been established there with uh, some accuracy that there was about 200 uh, of, of the militia of the time and volunteers. And for the, the, the patriot or the rebels as they were known mm -hmm. by the, the uh, the British then, uh, the maximum could be about 600. And remember one thing that the, the Patriots, uh, there might have been one musket, an old musket to about every 10 or 15 of them. What the others had? Oh, well, they were supplied by the, uh, the government of the time. The, the militia and the, the volunteers, like uh, the one, in the, the, this man here, uh, they had uh, arms furnished by the British government, so they had the uh, the arm, like the musket, a good musket of the time, compared to the. Well, I mean, the what did well, you know, but I mean, what did the other patriots have? If only one in ten had a gun, the others have a stick or a spear. Oh yes, oh yes, they they had old uh, old piece of uh, old knives, for instance, uh, or uh, or sabers. Uh huh. Or, uh, that they, they were cutting, putting at the end of uh, a, a stick. Uh -huh. uh, some of them had, uh, uh, had called roto. Right, uh, right, rake. Rake. A rake or old uh, wooden fork. They were not, they were not really uh, soldiers. Mm -hmm. They were not trained and they, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of them were forced uh, to right. follow them. Okay, for you French people out there, it wasn't a rake, it was what? Roto. And it was a roto. And while we're picking up the, uh, the, the, the elements of the battle here, we're going to take a short break. We're, we're talking about Odal Town, just over the border, part of our heritage up here, the, the French and the coming down. And we're going to be t we're talking with, a, uh, well, let's say a half a resident of our area, Mary the Champlain girl, Jean, uh, Jean Lebrun married Jean. Uh, they both spell it the same way. And Robert Boyce on my left, uh, uh, we're in his house and we're going to have a meal, I guess, before we continue. Be right back. <laughs> All right, we're going to go into the post office a little bit here, and the mail here is the mailing address is Lacole. Is that right? Right. right. And it's always been Lacole. Uh, one time it was Old Town. Old Town had Old their own post office. It had a small post office where people could go and get their mail. Was there a postmaster there? There was a no. It was in a store. And so it was a sub. Office of La Coal. Yes, yes. All right. It was a grocery store and, a, and a, some mailboxes and money orders, that sort of thing. Okay, but it was in a store. It was, it was part in of a store. Store. Okay. And now they have a post office separate? It's a separate post office. It's not part of a store in La Coal today. Oh, no, that's right. Gover oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, okay. It's a government building. Okay, yeah. we're going to talk about some postmasters, I think. Yeah. If we. You remember this gentleman yes. here that we saw yep, a little while ago? Okay. Traver 
Van Vliet. He was appointed. Then the title was Deputy Postmaster of La Cole up in the province of Lower Canada on the first day of February 1838. That's right about the time of that uh, uprising. That is that right. Was also yeah. 38, yeah. And you know too that the in 1838 uh, it was mentioned, uh, it referred to as the first year of Her Majesty uh, reign. That was uh, the Queen Victoria. And we have his son here, George Manning Van Vliet. He was the second postmaster of La Cole, and uh, he was uh, appointed the postmaster on the 23rd day of August 1876. Who appointed him? His father? Oh, no, no, no. He, no, no. He, but stay right in the family? Oh, yeah. Time, it, it, That's right. First Van Fleet had been postmaster right along. That's right. But the first, uh, we're talking about the, the first postmaster in the Van Fleet family. Right. Because there was two other postmasters before they talked about. Okay. Right. So after uh, George Manning, his son, George Jonathan Van, uh, Van Fleet of La Cole, he was appointed the postmaster of La Cole on the 8th day of November 1915. He followed his father? That too? is right. So three three people in a row. All uh, we're coming. The oh fourth, right. the fourth oh, one. Come on. uh, the, the fourth, fourth one, one in a row? row? Yeah, fourth one in a row. Uh, this one is uh, John Charles Van Vliet of La Cole. He was uh, a point. Just, uh, I'm making a mistake. Oh, yes. Yeah, John Charles Van Vliet of La Cole was appointed. To the uh, as the postmaster of La Cole on the fourth of January, nineteen forty-seven, and uh, John uh, Charles uh, Van Vliet he resigned his post on the thirty-first of March, nineteen seventy. So, if we take take from the the first, yeah, one hundred and thirty years, one hundred and thirty-two years and two months of Van Vliet, Van Vliet four generations in a row. Very, very English in one of the most French communities in the area. Yes, but right? uh, you must uh, those people, they were talking French. Oh, they uh, were? This, right. this one I knew personally, and uh, uh -huh. uh, Robert uh, did also, and I, I know that uh, his father also was talking. So did the family, the rest of the family, like his brothers or something, did they live right around the coal area too? Oh, yes. Farms, or what did they do? Uh, the family, uh, well, oh, the, the, there was quite a few uh, of them, of the Van Vliet on farms. Uh, but this, there's a, a good story uh, too of this. Uh, looks like George Bush. See, looks like George Bush's father. If you saw the program, it looks just like George Bush's father. You know, you're the second one that mentioned that. Yeah, it right. Looked like yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't remember who said that. It, it, not too long ago. Maybe it was me in the post office over there, or when we were in the library. Oh, I don't no. know. Oh yes, was yes, it? Yes, because he yes, sure does. Uh, I had just seen a program about uh, George Bush and also his father, and uh, his father looked a lot like that picture. Well, so I here I am. Yeah, I still think so. Well, that is remarkable when you think of 130 some odd years the, the same family in the post office. I don't think that there's any other. Uh, Places that postmaster in line like that mm -hmm. were so long as postmaster. What's your postmaster's name after 1970? There were no more Van Fleets. No, but a bit, not that they should be getting it. But I was just thinking when you get that kind of a of a, a string, you know. Now the other one, the, the postmaster that replaced uh, John was uh, Leo Dow Ryan, and the present. Uh, Postmaster is uh, Robert uh, Girard. All right. Well, uh, we're going to be going. We'll be talking with Jean again another time. Uh, more about the La Cole area, where right? we've covered most of Odeltown. That's right. History in and around the Odeltown community, at least as a group. And uh, we're going to look around the house a little bit now. The former store. Where Robert's going to show us a couple of very unusual things. You're going to particularly watch the windows. The very thickness of the walls, they go anywhere. You mentioned along, and you can pick this out, well, it's a little bit warmer here, parts of the house he's not using. You said that the the window casings are, are, are this deep, they're probably three feet, and they get narrower as you go upstairs. Did, did you well, tell, did uh, you tell yeah, me that? Robert no. can explain that more. 
In the basement, the, the uh, wall is four feet. Four feet thick. Thick. The first floor is on. It's three feet thick because the 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 inlays are laid on the on the stone foundation. Six inch, a foot in. You go to the second floor. It's two feet. Okay. So each at each level, the the wall gets smaller, and the attic is down to about about ten inches. Okay. Inside the wall, there's two walls of stone with an airspace in between. That was the old way of making insulation. Say that again. In the stone house, yeah. there's two walls. So it's not one stone the full no, thickness. It's two walls, and there's an airspace in between. That's the insula that's the insulate. The old insulation. It's just air. There's nothing air. Just air. Is there very much of a distance between? Is there an inch? Or, you don't, You haven't seen it. Inside. That's the way it's done. And uh, there are many houses, uh, you know, Spiegel's home there in Rouse's Point, the big, the big stone house. They have very thick uh, walls. And that also, they got windowsills that are, you know, 18 inches uh, deep. And there are many other houses around as you, as you go in these older homes, look for that. It, it's a dead giveaway of the thickness of the walls. Very difficult sometimes when you're putting in a heating system that when you bring it up along the wall in the basement, you're three feet out of the, on the floor, right? And it just, it just, you can't get the pipes along the wall. Very, very difficult. Okay, we'll uh, be moving around the building. This, we're in the kitchen area now. Is this part of the original building? No, this is, this has been put on in 1951. Was there anything here before? There was a shed moved here before, which my father built and moved it. The old foundation of the store is right outside the door here, window here. The old foundation of the store? Okay. I mean, it, it was a, bigger before? Yes. And uh, instead of drawing the stones away, we put cement over top to make a, a gallery. Yep. Okay. Uh, well, thank you very much, John. While we're here and uh, uh, talking about the Lacole part, is there anything else that we might have missed as you went along the way that you want to mention about Lacole? Not Lacole, but the uh, Odal Town that you can think of? We mentioned about know, the people yeah. who were born here, the uh, the, the Marns and uh, Ruth Edgerton and so forth, where a uh, family that was here. Anybody else that you know that was in, that ever lived in this house that we might know? All right, nothing like that. Mm. Jean, where do you live, Jean? You live I'm in Lacole? No, no, in Old Old Town. You live in Old Old Town. Oh, no yeah. wonder you know Old Old Town. <laughs> How many hours could you spend on work like this? There's a lot of hours. Well, there's a, on this, to get to that, uh, over 11 years of uh, work. And uh, I work sometime until 3, 4 o'clock in the morning. But I don't get up in the morning. I'm with you. I do the same yeah. thing. Now, so if anybody wants to reach me in the in the day uh, in during the day, and uh, Robert is smiling, you know, I I don't know that. I don't hear the phone or even people knocking. And you don't want to hear it, right? Noon. That's right. Before, before noon. noon. Well, see, I'm oh, up by nine. Yeah, nine I program myself there, yeah. and I tell people if you want yeah. to reach me between yeah. uh, noon until midnight. Yeah. If, right. I, if I am at home. Right. And after midnight, you, your time is your own and you can do just as you please. Oh, well, I say after midnight, uh, up to midnight because uh, most of the people are bed, in bed by that right. time. Yeah. I call people at 10.30, they're in bed. I feel bad, but if you call me before 9, I'm in bed. You know, cause I, I, I'm on a different schedule. Yeah. Now, what do you intend to do with this information? Well, You're not going to leave it in folders okay, oh, no, forever? No, no, no. Right uh, b uh, before July, uh, I will make like a pamphlet. You are going what, to put it. What we saw. You're going to print it out. Uh, that will be like the photos uh, going along with and telling the, the the story of each of those places, because uh, this year uh, there's a that I research over 15 different big holiday anniversary, you know, by multiple of five or ten years. Like uh, as you remember, I was saying 260, yes, 250, yes. To, right. and so on. So this uh, we plan to make uh, a pamphlet. In, in, in English and also in French. And it's to be for sale? Yes. And that will be available uh, at the Oral Town Church uh, in July and August. Mm -hmm. And I would think there are many people over in that uh, are watching this program that have relatives, very close relatives, that lived on this road and lived in Oral Town at one time. One I'm thinking of, I was talking with Betty and Gloria Ashline, and you know, their great 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 grandfather was uh, Prisk Asselin, who settled in Champlain, and she said, that one, I think her grandmother was a Musson, and the Mussons were from Odeltown. Oh yes, oh yes, not far from here and back. Uh, yeah. uh, her grandmother was Burke Musson, the the uh, the uh, dairy in Rouse's Point, you know, that sold the milk. 
uh, to the far, regular retail dairy. This it was her sister, and they were from up in this area. The the family started right up here in uh, and just across the border, I guess. Yeah, but uh, and I'll surprise you on this there uh, that there's people that come and visit me, or they write to me, and especially if they write uh, to uh, Peg Barkham uh, when she was right. the uh, town historian. Any information that people wanted about their ancestors, for instance, if they if there's a French name in it, she always referred them to me. And would you know that I've been sending information on different families of pioneers of old town throughout 15 different states in the United States to 29 different people. The last one I'm dealing with uh, uh, is two sisters, one uh, from California and the other one uh, in uh, New Mexico. Uh, not too long ago, uh, in August, as a matter of fact, there was a lady from... Uh, I don't remember the place, but it's in Missouri. Uh -huh. And there's one in Minnesota. There's one, the one from Missouri. Eh? She even uh, bought the video cassette that we made in French on uh, 12 different uh, historical monuments in the, mm -hmm. the Seigneury, mm -hmm. which we talked about, showed this building here, and she had seen it. Mm -hmm. I sent it to her, but of course I translate yeah. one piece of paper, the English version. And she says it was so good. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. Yeah, because I was able to bring her. Uh, well, uh, in front of this house here, I stopped and showed them the uh, the old store, and we went to the cemetery, Jackson Cemetery, and I was able to show her a uh, four generation of her ancestor buried in that cemetery. Is it safe to say for me to say that you like this as much as working for the customs? It's safe. <laughs> Even better. You enjoy this. Yes, but I can tell you, it's fun. I'm working a lot harder on this than I was when I was working in a custom. Don't you get a pension? Oh, yeah. Well, don't say that. They'll cut your pension. Oh, no, no, no. I said I'm working more. I mean, yeah, but that, that means you didn't paid. work enough then, and they'll cut your pension. Uh, or compared to that. Oh, okay, oh, because hey, we don't want to cut our pension. Oh, I love no, what no, I'm no, doing no. here, too, see? Oh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> what about... There's no way you can cut it. <laughs> I don't get enough. What about you, Robert? Now, uh, you operated this as a farm before? A dairy farm. Dairy farm. farm. And how many cows did you have? I had 202 head, and I was milk 100 cows. How many employees did you have? Well, my father was here. Yes. And uh, myself and an extra man once in a while. And you no longer have animals now? How long ago was this? Ten years ago. I had to go to the hospital, <laughs> and I got a knee replacement. And that was your main reason for for, for getting out of the dairy business? That's it's right. tough today though, isn't it? The dairy? It's very tough. Very tough. Very tough. Board of Health has made it impossible for us the government and all the taxes. Milk prices? Uh, They're very good in Canada. They yeah. are good in Canada? Well, because we have a very expensive milk quota to buy. Well, well that's, all right, that's one thing. You can take a minute, Calvin, on this. Uh, there is a milk quota. That's right. That you can only produce so much milk. That's and right. you can buy? You can buy the right to produce so much milk at each, uh, yeah. Do you buy it from somebody else? No, you buy it from the government. The government has control of that today. So they can either give it to you or not give it to you? No, if you if you you will not pay. Bid. You bid. Uh -huh. You bid. These are auctions. You mean you, you're you as a farmer, another farmer, both bid to get that extra? Yeah, but now it's by secret uh, secret uh, auction. Well, they get more that way. And think. actually, actually, the quarter is worth more than the farm, the land, and the machinery and the cattle. Is that right? Yeah. Now, when you got out of uh, milk, you know, did they, did you, were you able to sell your quota? I was. You got paid for your quota? Mm -hmm. I do. That's why I'm sitting here. And that's why we're going to have that big meal when we get finished here? <laughs> <laughs> but they did pay you to stop producing milk, and they sell no. that to somebody else. That's right, yeah. I sold my quota. But they didn't take the cows. You, you sold I, your own cows? I sold my own cows, and I had a year. Being I was going to the hospital, I had a year to make up my mind if I was going to go back or not. Mm -hmm. And the year I wasn't any, any better than I was. Mm -hmm. I sold because I couldn't find any help. I, that's what I was going to mention, but you know, when you, you didn't have that much help before. Your father, one, one man or so, that's, a lot of, that's not a lot of people afraid for a hundred cows to milk. Well, I milked before the men, before I got help in the morning. Yeah. And after they went home, I did the milking afterwards. Yeah. So my day was from half past three till. Do you help Jean with this with this information at all? No, I go and listen to him. You and then you just bring the gun and protect him, right. right? That's what you do. That's what I do. Robert, it's been a pleasure talking with you today, also, and thank you for making the 
your home available to us and to uh, Calvin on the camera, of course, and to Jean and I, it's, it's a pleasure. And I'll look for you when I when I go by Art's restaurant now and then. Okay. I was in there last night, um, and I didn't see him, but I was in there for half an hour, so I went in and had a, uh, a meal. I don't do that very often. I don't go to restaurants a lot, but uh, it was kind of slow last night. Anything else you want to tell me before we leave? We're going to go up and we're going to go up and see your house. You can talk to us more about that. And I can show you across the road from the house, I believe, where this used to have the, there used to be the stone the stone piggery belonged to the colonial mansion. We can take a picture from the house. Was the colonial mansion rebuilt in any way? Was there another building put up? Just got it. So there's nothing there at all. You just noticed the spot. Okay, we're going to go upstairs. We're going to leave the kitchen. We're going to go to other areas. And upstairs it isn't heated right now and all of it. So we'll be moving. We'll put a jacket on before we go up. And uh, Bob, is, Bob has curtailed himself to a small area in the downstairs for the winter, right? That's right. And he said besides that, he doesn't have to go out and work. So he's just got to... Be warm right where you're sitting, correct? That's right. Be right back. You're watching Hometown Cable Programs called What's Going On Here. I'm Bob Ben, Robert Boyce, uh, Jean Lebrun, and Calvin Castine. As I came into the living room, of course, I see a picture, and I'm very inquisitive, and I said, is this your d mom and dad? And you said, yes. Yes, they are. That's and their 45th wedding anniversary. Okay. Uh, are they are they both passed away? No, my, my mother's still living. Okay. I, yes. Your mother's a mile down the road here. Okay, and uh, we're in the room now that formerly was the store. Was the store, that's right. Back 150 years ago or whatever, huh? That's right. Or more. Uh, and then it became what? When you, when you first came here with your dad, this was that this room wasn't here. You built that, that 51? Room. Yes. This room was here, and it, was, it, was no, it wasn't lined or finished. It was all on stone. The walls were all The stone. walls were stone. Stone walls, and we, he put a... The finishing up. Mm -hmm. yeah. And at that time, the stairway was here. In so you went up the stairway in this direction. Right here, the stair used okay. to be up here. And the road is uh, looking straight ahead to our to your left is the, is the right. highway. That's right. Okay. And then the, there was a stairway here that went up. Went up. Are, are these real beams or are those those were made? Huh? No, they're real be real beams covered. No, all right. Yeah, real beams have been covered. Huge beams. And they covered them. Father covered them, yeah. Oh my, that's wow. too bad. The Yoon Bean people will l l lose their leg for a, for a Yoon Bean, you know. Now this cupboard, is that part of the old store? That's the cupboard my father built that cupboard when he come here in 1926-28. Built it there for the, it was, this was his kitchen? This was the kitchen, the original kitchen. Okay. Yes. And this okay. was the stairway to go upstairs. And he changed it. He took the stairway and put it on the other side so it would make a bigger room here. Okay. If you look at, I was mentioning to you before. Look at the thickness of the uh, <laughs> of the walls, see? Eh? And you mentioned that they were four feet downstairs, three feet up here, here. and this much of it is, is two feet here. That is the the sill, yeah. and then the stove. Because uh, I don't suppose those floors were there originally. At that time, there were big wide big doors. Big wide planks. What she and I put down. Mm -hmm. And particularly watch now, when we get upstairs, you'll notice a difference in the thickness, uh, as Robert had mentioned. And, well, I'll have to go upstairs. Upstairs. Okay, we'll witness upstairs with. Anything else? Oh, the door, the door I think you wanted to show us. Here's the door, which measured three and a half feet wide, which used to bring all the kegs of whiskey in. When they had the store. All right. At that building across the road, that stone building, was this was the pig house for the colonial mansion which was directly behind this building this white building in front so it was fire from the road yes yes and it, as far as you know it was a big house a big it was a big house i remember picking up the bricks and the uh, china broken china in the in the ground that was where our garden was back there okay so when you would be digging you'd find pieces from time to time That's right. yes yeah now the average door uh, of going outside is not uh, three feet probably would be what you'd normally see, right? Yeah. At the widest, and that's yeah. a big front door. But look at the width of this door. And again, you see, this is the wall. This is the, uh, yeah. this, and it's wider than this. That goes way out to here. Yeah. That's the thickness of the uh, uh, of the wall, the foundation. And of course, because there was no electricity, you might notice here, Calvin. Uh, you do it from this side, maybe. There's no place to put electric. So they they've got uh, they put this inside wall and it's part of the 
what they built because you cannot get into the cement. There's just no way. It's See the electric wires run on the surface. There's no place back there for anything. It's all uh, stone. We're looking at a door uh, that Bob brought to our attention, Robert. And first of all, I want to note that I'm all, I'm five foot nine, and look at the door. And these are not six foot eight doors. You know, that's usually what they are, right? They're eighty yeah. inches. Now this is about six feet maximum. Now what is what does this represent, Robert? This is the door belonged to the Masonic Lodge. And uh, they used to rap on this door and pass there was a secret password to get in the lodge and they would they would uh, this would close off the outside and they would find permission to enter the lodge. This was upstairs was upstairs. Okay, upstairs. This room was all one big big square. Mm -hmm. And uh, this door was, uh, when a visitor came and he wanted to get into the lodge, he would have to have a password and he would uh, give the password through to the lodge and they would give the okay whether he would, could be admitted or not. Okay, this obviously is the inside of the door. You can see the, uh, the, 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 the slide ball. What's the, what's the French name for the little thing you turn to keep a door closed? And crush. And, uh, and taca? Eh? Oh, and taca. And taca? My, my father used to say that. Okay. And then also, as part of the lodge, you found these up here, you said? These were all around the up, upstairs where the men would come in and they would be able to hang their hats on. But their hats were much deeper. Deep, the deep uh, stovepipe type hats, hats. Would, would hang on here. And then you said because they had this lease, uh, and it's a lifetime lease. Lifetime so they, lease. If they wanted to use this upstairs, I couldn't stop. You, they could. They, they could come here and do this. Yeah. Is there a Masonic lodge in this area at all? There's no? one in Noyen. That is the mother lodge, Noyen. Uh -huh. And there's one in Hemingford. But there's none in La Colle. Right? Okay. No. We can put this back. I pulled over here now. Let's get it out of your way. Uh, this is what I wanted to tell you, show you, because we mentioned it. You see the width of this sill in the very same house, because as Robert said. The the, uh, the the stones kept getting narrow and narrow because there was no reason nothing was going to be built on top of it, and this is directly cut. Here. This there is no wall here. This is paper directly on stone. That's right. Some places uh, they have your father downstairs put a piece, some two by fours or something. Two by fours and or wood. Uh, wood, yeah. Panel. But this is hard, and it's right directly onto the uh, that was it wasn't plastered. stone. It's plastered. It's plastered and underneath there. Yeah. And it's insulated, he says, in between the two set rows of stone going up. And that's it upstairs. Of course, the old-fashioned hooks, maybe that was when the family came. You didn't have closets in this type of house, so everything was hung wherever. And they have a, there's probably 12 along the wall here. Big, and these are usually brass. Yeah, not what they are. And they're, they're painted. That nice, shiny brass has been painted up here, but that's what they hung your clothes. We've enjoyed our visit here very much, Robert. Thank you for making the house available to us. And John, for... Uh, coming to be with us and I know you've done a lot of preparation you can see that and I hope you people out there have understood uh, it, it, it's all we've covered 200 years right over 200 oh, yeah. years and that uh, signore I didn't know what a signore was until today and I I still have my doubts I could write a thesis on it but uh, a little bit thank you very very much and we it, it's right in our backyard and we're only a mile remember only a mile from the Canadian border where all our custom people come to work right down here and we're what three miles from around this point? That's right. And you're right in the backyard but we're in another country. Thank you very very much. We'll be seeing you again. We'll be talking about the coal in the future and we'll kind of tie them together and we'll see you at our restaurant. That's right. Thank you. And Art, uh, this is going to cost you a little bit of money. We keep mentioning your restaurant out there and uh, if people want to talk to Robert they can go to his restaurant and say hi. That's right. And then when you see him say hello to him. Tell me you saw him on TV. We used to have a restaurant. Oh, tell us about your restaurant. Yeah, you used to have a restaurant. Yeah, I uh, I bought the Ultra View Cat or the Andre's restaurant Chez in I believe it was ninety or ninety ninety one, and I sold it in ninety two. Did you operate it? I operated for a year, well, for a year and a half. I did. Uh, did, did you work? Did you work there yourself? Yes, I did work. I, I worked myself, and I got marched to the border by the border patrol twice. <laughs> You did. <laughs> and I had to buy a house in Plattsburgh. Oh. Uh, so I get my working papers. Okay, then you sold it since? I sold both. I sold the house uh -huh. and I sold the restaurant. Okay, you came back to Canada. I came back to Canada. My mother was not the best of health and okay. there was no buyers for the farm. Okay. 
All right, and, and so you weren't there a long time. You say, what, six months? A, a year, year and a half. A year and a half? Year and All half. right. Yeah. Did you say you bought it in 90? I think it was 90. And, and you I sold it just recently? I sold it a year ago in December. Okay. So, All right. So if you've seen this man, that's where you saw him. Okay, that's it. We're going to call it quits. We're in uh, Odletown. That's the subject oh. of, of today. Thank you very much. You're quite welcome.